Ami Takepi, Shante Washte na Pechi Yuzapi, Wayne Dushino Imachiapie. Hello, my relatives. I greet you all with a good heart and a handshake. My name is Wayne Dushino, the Executive Director of Native Governance Center, and I'm calling in today from the beautiful homelands of the Cheyenne River, Lakota. On behalf of the Native Governance Center, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Native Governance Center is a Native led nonprofit that supports Native nations in strengthening their governance systems and capacity to exercise sovereignty. We encourage you to learn more about our programming by visiting our website, nativegov.org or by following us on social media everywhere at NativeGov. Today's virtual event, Land Rush to Land Back, Legacies of Allotment and Indigenous Resistance, will explore allotment's history and modern day implications for Native nations. Our panelists will explain why Native nations control just a small percentage of their original land base as a result of cessation through treaties and land theft. They'll also highlight ongoing Indigenous resistance and strategies Native nations are using to fight back. When we decided on this topic, I was particularly excited to help inform people on an issue that literally shaped this country from its founding until today. I can tell you from personal experience that this legacy, which stripped our ancestors of land, still looms large for Native peoples today. Before we dive into our content, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, I'd like to remind you all to submit questions for our Q&A portion by using the Q&A box on Zoom or the comments section on Facebook. We'll transition to Q&A Q at around 12.45 p.m. Central. This event is being closed captioned. You can turn on closed captioning by using the button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Finally, I'd like to give a shout out to our sponsors. Thank you to our first full event series sponsor, Anderson Realty, a boutique real estate brokerage with, 60 year, with a 60 year tradition that's simple, work hard and put people first. We're also grateful to API Group, a market leading business services provider of safety, specialty and industrial services for supporting our full event series as well. We're not quite done yet. Thank you to St. University of St. Thomas. St. Thomas educates students to be morally responsible leaders who think critically, act wisely, and work skillfully to advance the common good. We're also grateful to our friends at Steiger Vitelli and Associates for sponsoring us again this year. Steiger Vitelli and Associates is a strategy, communications, advocacy, and fundraising firm with a track record of successful campaigns, research initiatives, and multi-year planning blueprints. And finally, a big thanks to Woodlands National Bank for supporting this event. We're going to start today's event with a short presentation on allotment basics, and then we'll follow it up with a panel discussion. Next slide, please. To set a little context for today, I'll share with you that our panelists are going to talk about their experience navigating the modern day legacies of allotment, in addition to the history of land theft within our own within our nations. To provide context for the discussion, I'm going to explain a little bit about how the federal government carried out allotment and how allotment enabled the United States to steal indigenous land. Allotment is a part, oops, sorry, next, next slide. Allotment is a part of suite of a suite of federal policies responsible for facilitating the theft of indigenous land by non-indigenous people, governments, and entities. Our friends at the Indian Land Tenure Foundation, hi Chris, who just disappeared from the screen, view allotment as perhaps the single most devastating federal policy when it comes to indigenous land theft. In today's discussion, we use the word allotment to refer to the process of dividing up a collectively held land base into individual parcels. The federal government began carrying out allotment activities as early as 1798. Some early treaties, for instance, specified that land should be divided amongst individual native people. Allotment continued until the federal government ceased this policy around 1934. Why allotment, you ask? Well, white colonizers pushed for the allotment for the following reason. Allotment was an assimilation tactic. Prior to it, the federal government's previous policies aimed to separate native peoples from white society. As settlers continued to steal more land and occupy more space, the federal government shifted its approach from separation to assimilation. Federal policymakers concluded that if they moved Native people from what they saw as backward collective land use to individual land ownership, Native people would be more likely to cultivate the land, remain in one place, and ultimately discard their culture and values in favor of those of the colonizers. A lot of it was also about greed and theft. Colonizers wanted to open Native lands for settlement, railroads, and extractive industries. Allotment helped them achieve these goals. When thinking about the General Allotment Act of 1887, we have to talk about the proponents of allotment who pushed to make it a national policy. By the late 1880s, the federal government had already stolen the majority of native lands and forced native people onto reservations. At this time, more than 300 reservations have been created. In 1887, Congress passed the General Allotment Act. This act gave the United States president the ability to survey native land on reservations where it was deemed advantageous to do so and divide it into individual parcels. Of course, Congress did not consult with native peoples before passing the General Allotment Act. 
To break up the land, individual native people were sometimes allowed to select a parcel of land, most often between 40 and 160 acres. Otherwise, they had an allotment assigned to them by their agency superintendent. All remaining land, deemed surplus, was made available to non-native settlers, often farmers and ranchers. Native people were not granted the same relationship with their lands as other landowners. Unlike settlers, native people could not sell their land at any time. The Allotment Act declared native allottees as incompetent and mandated that the United States retain the legal title to the land as trustee for the allottees. After 25 years, native people could lease or sell their allotments. When we think about the aftermath, a huge percentage of native lands were stolen. Native land holdings dropped from 130 million, 138 million acres in 1887 to 48 million acres in 1934. Native, pre Native people struggled to survive on their site allotments, oftentimes because parcels were not suitable for small scale agriculture. Conveniently, the most productive lands were oftentimes identified as that surplus uh, of in to Indian needs and sold off to white settlers or business interests. Most Native people couldn't afford the necessary equipment, seeds, and livestock required for farming. Many times, allottees simply did not understand or did not want to become farmers. For others, intensive agriculture did not align with their culture and values. And understandably, Native people did not appreciate having their land stolen and their future life ways dictated by racist assimilation policies and ideologies. After the 25-year period expired, many Native allottees were forced to sell their land for almost nothing as a result of being cut off from their previous support and survival systems. After the 1887 Allotment Act, the United States government passed additional laws to make it even easier to steal indigenous allotments. An example, they granted themselves the ability to remove land from trust without a lot of knowledge and then later sold the land in tax foreclosure. Native folks had no idea they even owed the back taxes. Aside from allotment, the federal government used other tactics during this time frame to steal indigenous land as well. For example, the state of California stole land through 18 unhonored treaties that were never ratified by Congress using militia-led massacres and enslavement to attempt to erase indigenous culture. Our panelists all have different stories to tell about how land theft has impacted their nations, so we're certain to learn even more when our panel discussion begins. We're not going to go too much into detail on modern day legacies because that's why we have our wonderful panelists here with us today. But here are a few general legacies. That, we will, that will set the scene for our panel discussion. Yeah, next slide, please. Many Native nations that currently hold reservation land control just a small percentage of their land base, and this is after federal government stole the majority of their original homelands. So rather than tribal governments and individual tribal citizens stewarding and carrying out the vision of their land, we instead see big ag, vacation homeowners, the United States Forest Service, and others making decisions. Allotment policies allow non-native landowners to move in and control land set aside for reservations. As a result of allotment, native nations lost access to important sacred sites and must navigate checkerboarded, literally land that looks like a checkerboard due to mixed ownership and fractionated ownership among other issues. To understand fractionated ownership, think about how after the deaths of the original native allottee, Title ownership oftentimes was divided among their heirs. Through each successful generation of heirs, the number of owners grew exponentially. That ends our brief allotment basics, and I now get the distinct honor to introduce our moderator for today's panel. Let's all welcome our host, Dr. Twyla Baker. Twyla will kick off our panel discussion, and I'll leave it to her to tell you a little bit more about herself. Take it away, Twyla. Sure. Um, well, hello, everybody. Uh, uh, my name is Twyla Baker, and I am currently serving as the president of Nuita Hiratsa Sahnish College. Um, I was born and raised on the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation, and I make my home here now. Um, we call ourselves the MHA Nation, or Manan Hiratsa and Rikra Nation, and we're located in Northwest North Dakota. Um, I've been with the NGC as a board member for a number of years now, so um, but I, I'm continually learning from the, the network that um, NGC has built and continues to build and the, 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 just the sheer knowledge and um, uh, uh, professionals that I get to come into contact with, um, uh, with my um, alignment with, with NGC. 
So um, I'm really so terribly honored to be here with um, our panelists today. And I'm going to uh, kind of go round robin based on what I can see on my screen and let everybody um, introduce themselves. So I'm going to start with Brooke. Hi, um, I'm going to do my introduction in Iraq first. So I agree, Nick now, Brooke Thompson, or Tech May Walk Cook, Santa Cruz Oak, Puda Galawe, Essay Picha Galawe, Ni Pichuas I Walk Archie Thompson. So my name is Brooke Thompson. I'm from the Yurok and Cordo tribes in Northern California, Yurok enrolled. And I am currently in Santa Cruz, California, doing my PhD in environmental studies at UC Santa Cruz. My family is from the Watek village and I'm the granddaughter of, I walk, rest in peace, Archie Thompson of the Yurok tribe. Thank you so much for, for joining us today, Brooke. Okay, I see Adam next on my screen. Amadaki api chante wishin at choose api do adim hemi do Dakota ya papan ho wash de maki api do pju tizizi o kapi edwati ka hemata hondo um dayanya hippi hello everyone get the handshake from the heart I am Adam my Dakota name is papan ho wash de um I am from the Upper Sioux community otherwise yellow medicine nation pju tizizi o kapi place where we dig the yellow medicine um. And welcome everyone. I'm currently the tribal secretary for our board of trustees. And with the little time I have, I also teach college classes to community youth in the area, um, indigenous studies and Dakota nation studies. So thank you for having me. We're so glad you could join us, Adam. And last but not least is my friend, Chris Stainbrook. <laughs> I am Chris Steinbrook. If I, if I gave you an introduction, a proper introduction, I'd have to talk as fast as Wayne did. Um, and so I'm not going to do that. I'm president of the Indian Land Tenure Foundation and former, former board member for NGC. Um, we work uh, on all things Indian land related at the foundation. And we're located in Little Canada, Minnesota, just north of the Twin Cities. Awesome, thank you so much. So we're gonna dive right into uh, some of these questions and I do encourage um, our audience members to um, please do submit your questions. Um, uh, staff is gonna be on hand to kind of assist me in fielding some of those as well. Um, but we've got a few prepared um, questions in regards to the, the matter at hand. Uh, so I'm gonna start out with the first one. What are some tangible ways land theft and the legacies of allotment currently impact your nation? And I have Aisha Brooke as our first respondent. Yeah, I'll, I'll try my best to start it out strong here. So just a little background on me. Um, I'm currently 27 and I grew up on the Yurok Reservation. So I was around tribal lands my entire life growing up and still am. And for me, I had allotment that me and my family lived on that was given to us by my grandfather's uncle. And part of me realizing when I brought some friends there now, and I just had right friends from my university that I wanted to see my reservation and understand my homeland. So we went up just this last month and I showed them my you know, land that my family got from allotment and brought them in the area. And then they made the comment that, right, my my tribe's from the Klamath River in Northern California. And obviously we had a lot larger area initially, but we've still been on original homeland and our reservation is a mile on either side of the river from the mouth to about 44 miles up. And our allotment land is all in floodplain. And I've never realized that until recently because I was telling them how hard it is to move back home and how I would like to build structures and live closer to my family. But if I can't really build anything in the area because it's all floodplain. And so if I build anything, it's probably gonna get flooded or washed out, which in the winter time, which makes it really difficult to try to be home. And then my grandfather also was given an allotment. And what I was told is 
that he was forced to sell it when he wasn't really understanding what he was doing when he was younger. So with the Yurok tribe, it's growing up, I haven't really seen like a solid reservation. It's been checkerboarded in the sense that because a lot of people had to sell their allotments out of need just because, right, there's not a lot going on when it comes to food and resources and jobs by our reservation, because we live in such a rural area in Northern California, that the allotments were sold often to white folks. And then because of that, the reservation isn't that solid one mile on either side of the river. It's a lot of like um, private white families that own sections that should technically be in trust in the reservation. And then I also see, I had the benefit of being on the Senate committee or being an intern for the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs in Washington, D.C. in 2018. And I saw concern when tribes, when they buy land and want to put it in trust, meaning that, right, they don't have to pay taxes on it if it's in trust, it's held by the government. So that's less cost to the tribe. That everyone thinks that the second natives get a piece of land in trust that we're going to put, you know, casinos on it and we're going to bring bad people into the area. And so then there's this hesitancy to let the tribes re-put land into trust. And because of that, you know, we have to then as a tribe pay taxes on it, which we're already stretched thin and don't make a lot of money as it is. So then we can't put as much money to other resources. And then the last thing I'd say on it is that for me, like currently one of the frustrations with that as well is that a lot of, right, my tribe is by Del Nor in Humboldt County. It's known as like the <laughs> weed capital of the United States. And so initially there was like a lot of growing farms in Northern California on the reservation land, which one was polluting water sources through blocking streams with small dams and then not taking them down when they got out of there and then fertilizer pollution. But also when, you know, these growers wanted to leave, they're trying to sell the land for almost a lot more than it's worth because it's in these really remote areas that not a lot of people necessarily want to live in or build businesses on. But it was a part of our original territory. And some of these people got wise to that and know that the tribe really wants to buy these areas. And so they inflate the price more than it probably should be because they know how much we want to buy the land as a tribe and how lo local tribal members want to buy the land and go back home and live in our ancestral area. And they're using that to inflate the price, which just makes it harder on all of us. And trying to buy land back home and trying to move back home, I've seen that personally. Thank you, Brooke. Um, I'm going to move the same question over to Adam. Um, if you, just as a reminder for folks, what are some tangible ways land theft and the legacies of allotment currently impact your nation? Um, I'll try to speak, uh, I guess, more practically speaking, um, just for people or so people are aware, the Upper Sioux community was kind of formed on unique circumstances in the 1930s. So the current land base we have now wasn't necessarily subject to allotment. We'd have to go back to the 1880s during the Dawes Act, specifically to kind of see the manifestation of how the land allotment affected Upper Sioux as we know it today. And what I mean by that is the stories that we tell and what we hear from our elders and then their grandparents, great grandparents, is that um, many of the people that formed Upper Sioux in the 1880s had left their varying jurisdictions of reservation life due to the Dawes Act, that individual parcels were being allotted to families for farming, and they had to be um, subject to the BIA rules around what that looked like in the first place. Um, so one of the reasons, as well as many other reasons, um, Dakota people returned to the Grant Falls area in southwest Minnesota was because of allotment itself. It was not aligned with the cultural values of what it meant to be Dakota. Um, privatization of land, ownership, and a, subsi a subsidence farming lifestyle just was not the way of life Dakota had envisioned on reservation life. Um, so in the 1880s, the first two individuals that were able to get individual ownership 
in the Granite Falls area where Lazarus Skyman or Cloud Man, he's often referenced as, as well as Big Eagle. Um, and Big Eagle was a prisoner of war post Dakota War in Davenport for a number of years. Um, but fortunately, he was able to return home in the 1880s um, and inevitably lived out his life until the early 1900s. So that's one practical way that allotment has kind of had a butterfly effect on the formation of the upper suit community. And so much so in the 1900s when they were trying to formally organize um, the Dakota people at the time there were really against individual allotments of lands. And what I mean by that is that they hold the simple fee title um, to their individual selves or their family. And they really like the idea of the land being held in trust. Um, that way the individual land ownership couldn't be sold and allotted off to non-Dakota people. Um, and that served as the basis of how Upper Sioux formed in the 1930s was a very strong urge by the Dakota here to keep the land in trust to avoid the individual allotment, as well as that any land is really dictated by the governing body of the Upper Sioux community to individual families to hold in their name, but it's still owned and operated by the tribe itself. Um, so yeah, allotment has a very long legacy at Upper Sioux. And I think the third practical idea of around allotment is with original enrollment. Um, throughout reservation era, the enrollment numbers the BIA agents issued kind of became the basis and understanding of who was Indian and who wasn't Indian. Um, so what happened to those Dakota that left reservation life to form a pursue, sometimes a pursuit community, even by its own members, um, think we're almost like a second tier reservation because we never had allotment. We never had BIA original roles as people call them. Um, so yeah, those are a handful of, I guess, practical ideas of how allotment has affected the upper pursuit community. It's kind of almost a mishmash of different ways to dispossess a people, isn't it? <laughs> so, uh, okay, so um, I want Chris to be able to weigh in on that, that question, but I also want to move to the next, next one in interest of time. So maybe you can wrap it up into two. Um, and Chris is really smart if we can do stuff like that. So I'm going to ask the next one. What is the biggest challenge your nation or nations in general? Face related to modern day land use. We'll go right to Chris. Well, thank you. Let me let me make a comment on the first one um, because I think what we what we don't recognize because we've lived with this trust relationship for such a long time is that the trust relationship as we know it today got born out of the Dawes General Allotment Act, um, and that's when. The federal government, of course, declared all Indian people incompetent to handle their own affairs. Otherwise, you couldn't you couldn't get your land into trust, and that even continues today. And I think that's that's probably the overarching uh, piece of the Dawes Allotment Act that that lingers on. And at some point, we need we need to be changing that. I think um, as you look at even today. Um, and land use on the reservation, one of the things that that trust relationship requires is that you get the secretary's permission for almost every land transaction you do on the reservation. And so if you want to transfer your property, you need to get the secretary's permission. If you want to um, build a home on it, you need to have the secretary's permission. And it, and it goes on and on and, and if a tribe takes over part of the governance of that in some mechanism, then you can avoid some of it, but the secretary still has that overarching um, oversight on the property. And, and so what usually typically happens, and of course they then require appraisals for everything, and appraisals, if you're going to transfer land or, and or build on it, you have to get these appraisals first. The appraisals are running three to four years behind, um, if you can even get them done. And so ultimately, if you're going to manage um, your property and your development, 
economic development, conservation, any other activity um, becomes a long-term process. And I think that's been one of the major impediments over time for the tribes. It, it's, it's strange, and I'm just weighing in my two cents here because uh, one of the purposes was, was essentially, for a lot of this was to supposedly introduce us and in, you know the, the whole assimilation policy and everything like that. But even with that, policy, um, the roadblocks were set up in terms of not being able to essentially establish generational wealth for future generations going forward, because we have to do things like what Wayne mentioned in the, in the chat where he was attempting to gift land, but he had to get permission from someone to do so. So we're still not seen as having the capacity to make our own decisions on our own behalf for our peoples. And so we cannot succeed even in that assimilation world, because we can't hand down generational wealth, we can't we can't do those types of things. Even if we, you know, so we're kind of in a catch twenty two situation. But that's a, that's an aside. So um, I'm going to move the question to Chris. Oh, I'm sorry, Brooke. Chris just answered. <laughs> I mean, I would be happy to hear him speak again on it. <laughs> um, the question was about the biggest challenges to my nation today when related to modern day land use, correct? Okay. Um, yeah, so I mean, just a bit more history. The, and this is a quote from Frankie Myers, our uh, vice chair in the Yurok tribe in a 2019 court case. In a matter of 130 years, the Yurok people lost over 1.49 million acres of land. And during um, how the land has been split up is in 2007, the tribe owned about a quarter of the reservation's original land. Another quarter of the reservation land was is privately owned and about half of it was owned by the Green Diamond Timber Company. And so for me, and again, I work for the Yurok tribe as a restoration engineer, but just making it clear that I don't speak for the tribe itself, just my personal self as a citizen, but it feels like a lot of the current day, like what we're spending energy and time on is almost cleaning up and spending this time and money and energy trying to restore this land and get it back to not exactly where it was beforehand because we live in the rugged forest. Those trees grow for thousands and thousands of years. We won't see that change in many lifetimes back to where it was before, if it can even get there. But just trying to get back to a place where there's a level of sustainability and where we can continue to practice our traditional, you know, our traditional ways of living that's mutually beneficial to the land. And I see that with the restoration jobs, for example, where, for example, there's one project we're working on where we're helping restore rivers that were tilled through the gold mining era. And so these big hydro or what are they called? Hydraulic machines that were used to get gold out of the rivers now leaves all these tillings that filled in streams and has altered rivers to not be as beneficial to salmon and other ecosystems as it should be. And so now we have to spend time and effort restoring them and then restoring the forests that were logged by the timber companies and the habitat and the condors, which my tribe is trying to restore. And I wish that we had this time and energy to also spend on these larger climate crises. Because for me, indigenous leadership needs to be there when it comes to the world, when it comes to climate change and having our indigenous understanding of the world that we've been really not by accident living on land and having everything work out, but really by design and by expertise and indigenous knowledge and understanding of the environment. And that can be applied to a much larger scale, but instead of you know, helping the world lead itself when it comes to climate change, we have to spend so much time and energy trying to get back the land that we were originally taking care of and trying to restore all this damage that's been done over the last you know, 150 years or so. Because my tribe we had a, we didn't have any of our treaties ratified, not really in California at all. And we didn't get the reservation until executive order in 1855. And then the general allotment act happened in 
1887. And so again, it's for us current day, it's mainly dealing with the repercussions of not only having that land taken, but taken and then really used and abused for the last century or so. And then us trying to get it back, the difficulties that Chris talked about with when you try to get it back, putting it back in trust and trying to do anything on it, and then trying to restore it for future generational use and also for our own sake. It, it's so frustrating to watch it happen, um, honestly, because the fact, that, the fact of the matter is that the restoration benefits everybody too. That's the whole thing is that the, the thinking is not just necessarily just indigenous people, but everyone needs to have this land to, to be functional and just to su support life, period. So Adam, I'm gonna move over to you. Um, let's see, and I wanna make sure that I get the right question. Uh, what is What strategies is your nation using to fight back against the modern day legacies of allotment and land theft? What's working? What do you still hope to try? I think the biggest thing at Upper Sioux Community is just the, the management asset part in terms of our land base and how we acquire land, um, who has jurisdiction and who doesn't have jurisdiction. I know in the early 2000s, uh, just talking with former leadership here, um, there was a lot of pushback because the BIA isn't included in our constitution. The DNR thought they had oversight on certain things, so on and so forth. And then, but the moment you take a, take a stance and have the courage to say like, no, this is our land, you have no right to be here. There, there really is no legal standing for those agencies, particularly if the tribe's sovereignty is built that way particularly through its constitution, where you don't necessarily always need um, permission through the BIA or the Secretary of Interior in regards to land management itself. Um, principally speaking, though, I wanted to, Chris had mentioned the trust relationship we have with the Department of Interior and the federal government. And we, we view that as a barrier to our sovereignty still, because there's a lot of irony in having to purchase land around us and that once we get that fee and title back to us, we have to then turn it over to the BIA in the first place for quote unquote our sovereignty to apply. And so there's like hypothetical questions and debates we've had where it's like, what happens if you take that, once you purchase that land and burn, for, for metaphorically speaking, burn the title that says you're now the owner from the state, counties and federal government's point of view, you burn the title and just say, no, that we own it as a tribal nation. We're gonna claim reservation status and sovereignty status on it. Um, obviously that's a very um, idealist type of way of thinking, but um, you know, that's something to think about taking it to court, see what would happen in that type of scenario. But I think the biggest things for tribes, just generally speaking is Sometimes they, it's hard to even imagine um, not including the BIA in your constitution in the management of your own lands for the day-to-day -day operations for what that may look like and trying to move through that paternalistic relationship you have with the federal government as a whole. Um, so those are some practicalities and Upper Sioux has always tried to maintain its sovereignty and try to be more idealistic, but, you know, that's a, that's a, far bigger existential question for us to kind of figure out going forward. Thank you for that, Adam. Um, I think that I am going to move to one more question and we'll go all the way around the panel. Um, and then we'll start looking at the um, audience questions. Um, uh, so I'm gonna jump to um, Chris again, uh, what can the average person in our audience do to support Native Nations efforts to strengthen their sovereignty and reclaim land? Well, I think this one is, um, I would say, relatively easy. So if, if you're a tribal government official on the call, I think there's an opportunity to, to think ahead and intentionally look at your land and say, okay, Let's, let's truly examine the land we have, the land we want, and lay out a plan for that. But you have to have that mindset that you intentionally do it, not do it when some issue comes up with the county or city or somebody else. I think if you're 
if you're an individual Indian undivided landowner, you need to know your rights and you need to understand the processes that affect your rights on that undivided interest on the allotment, including, especially including the American Indian Probate Reform Act of 2004. Because if you don't have a will, you need to get a will. Otherwise, you're going to be subjected to um, what the federal government uses for attempting to resolve the issues of undivided interest holders. And, and you could be separated from your land and without a will. And so you need to have that in place. I think for the general public, um, those of you who are on the call from the general public, I think just understanding how, what the history of Indian land is, how we got to where we're at, what are the holdings? I think, you know, in the, I don't know, 40 talks I give a year to the general public, um, I would guess probably less than nine, probably less than 10% of the general public thinks of Indian country as even existing. And if it exists, it's, it's the entirety of the reservation. So for instance, here in Minnesota, if you drive across Highway 2, you come to a sign that says, welcome to the Leech Lake Reservation. And you drive another 60 miles and it says you're now leaving the Leech Lake Reservation. And so the impression is all of that land you just drove across is owned by the Leech Lake band of the, of the Jibwe. And in reality, they own 4% of their original reservation between individuals and the tribe. So there's this real misconception out there. Um, most of the general public remembers the days in school where they did Wednesday before Thanksgiving made their um, construction paper, pilgrim hats and feathers. And that's as much education as they got. And I think it's important that the general public really understand Indian land and the issues around it. Thank you, Chris. Um, Brooke, I'm gonna to move to you. Yeah, Same thank question. you. Um, a few things. One, what Chris said reminded me of something one of my friends, Nancy, said to me that she experienced when she was in school. You're talking about kids making pilgrim hats and whatnot. And she actually, in her school in Oklahoma, they had, I think, a land rush day where students were given stakes and they had to run onto like their field and try to stake their piece of land and people would go and rush and be a fun activity for kids. But think of how traumatic that is for like the native students in the school. I'm surprised she had to do that when she was younger and she's my age. So I, I they stopped doing it since then. But one, if you're a part of a school district that does that, like stop, like, please <laughs> don't, don't do that. It's, it's not right. These things that could be seen as fun and history learning for some students could be really traumatic and really disenfranchising to others. And so when you know, if you're in a school district, take a second to look back and see what education your kids are getting and try to supplement that because I didn't learn any of this in school myself in California and in Oregon. And then two, I, something that reminded me that was said earlier too is that, you know, don't, don't infantilize tribes, right? There is this idea that tribes can't be trusted with their own land. And that is insane to me considering that a lot of our government, well, all, almost all our governments and like all our, not necessarily governments, but our systems and our ways of being have been here way before the US government has. We're much older and yet we're the ones being treated like children that we can't be trusted with our own land. And so if you're in a position where you're working with tribes, tr trust them. And if they don't have the tools to work in the system, you know, help them get those tools and understand and take that time because we have the capability to take care of our own land base in the US. And not only the capability, but expertise that will specifically help land thrive. And then lastly is if you, well, I guess two last things. One, when wherever you go, try to understand, this was also said previously, whose land you're on and try to just understand a bit about the people and who's currently living there. And if you're in an urban area, 
try to figure out what the most prominent tribes in those urban areas are, you know, go to a powwow in your um, city, go to native marketplaces and support native businesses and learn about the history of wherever you are. And like in Santa Cruz, California, where I'm at right now, we have the Ama Mutsin Land Trust that you can donate money to. So it can continue to help them take back their own sovereignty when it comes to relearning about the history of their own area and participating in indigenous, traditional indigenous knowledge. And then lastly, I would say is if you own a piece of land, especially if it's like rural and open, see if any tribes in the local area have any plants that are significant to them that grow on your land and invite them to help restore their culture, or gather or reconnect with the land. You don't have to necessarily like give all your land away today, but you know, it's land back is not only about my year say land back too, by the way. Uh, <laughs> it's it's not only about like physically buying the land back and putting it into trust, but it's about this reconnection and you know, hiring tribes to do restoration work that's available to everyone in the public, having tribes be able to easily gather on public lands, having this connection and sense of community brought together that's about relationships with plants and the environment and not just the trading of property titles. Okay, thank you, Brooke. Adam, same question. I think first and foremost, just general awareness and education, attending a panel like this to understand sovereignty, um, principally speaking, and what, what that actually means and matters to tribes. Um, I think a simple analogy we often use at Upper Sioux here is we, we don't even call our casino a business, we call it an enterprise. And we call it an enterprise because it's a, it's a function of government. It helps supplement how we operate, um, our own land management, obviously our tribal citizens, but it's not just a business to us. It's a function of government that helps supports us and quite frankly, just um, meet our basic necessities from food, water, electricity, so on and so forth. I think just having those general basic understandings instead of um, distilling tribes across the country down to casino owners, which they are, but understanding at minimum that the casino is a function of their government to help support and sustain themselves. Um, other practical ways to help support is um, just continuing to share that education, um, but as well as if you're near a tribe and you're looking to sell land, you know, why not contact them um, for that to happen, particularly if your land is contingent of their lands. I guess in the last two years alone, Upper Sioux, we've had an uptick of nonprofits, private landowners reach out to us, some of which um, have wanted to donate land to the Upper Sioux community. And it's not much, but, you know, the principle is there of their understanding that this land was Dakota people's land at one point, and maybe it should go back to them. Um, sometimes the land isn't the most practical to, I guess, receive the donation from, so we have turned down people. But also understand that tribes are more than willing to negotiate at fair market value as well. Um, for a number of years, local farmers contingent of land around Upper Sioux just outright refused to sell to the Indian. Or if they did, they would uptick the market value two, three, four times more than what it's supposed to be. Um, so just kind of distilling some of those myths of the sovereignty, what land ownership means, and um, understanding expanding land base for individual tribes is usually a priority. Thank you so much for that. Um, Okay, so we're gonna move to some of the audience questions. Um, I love a lot of the, the, the responses that we've had thus far uh, in terms of like the relationship of respect and understanding of tribal governance and their, and their sovereignty. Um, I think um, a lot of you have hit on the idea that, um, uh, that that respect relationship isn't, isn't necessarily there in a lot of these, in a lot of these circumstances. And uh, um, like if a municipality, a local municipality, and this happens all the time, 
if they mismanage funds, mismanage lands, mismanage resources, the federal government isn't automatically coming in and saying, well, you guys aren't responsible enough. You're not capable of taking care of your city, of your county, of your, think of it in those terms for the folks who are listening. That's what happens to tribes. That's what happens to us. So um, I'm gonna jump to this next question. Um, how can Native nations work together? Native nations work together to resist the lasting impacts of allotment and land theft. Do you see opportunities for collaboration outside of Indian country in this fight? I feel like even just having this panel is a means by which Native nations are working together to, to um, address the, the issue at hand. But um, uh, Chris, do you wanna uh, take the first? Sure. We, uh, in fact, we've worked with a number of tribes working together on some land returns. Um, Peshwa being one of the larger ones in the Black Hills, um, that's involved eight, eight different tribes. Um, we help with just managing some of the financing on it. And, and so there's those opportunities. So again, at Bear Butte, we have a number of tribes involved in different land purchases up at Bear Butte. Um, and and again, and we do the financing on some of it. The you know they there's that opportunity. I think one of the places that we're that I would like to try before the days that the foundation come to the uh, to my end um, is I would like to try a trading platform on undivided interest between tribes. Um, we proposed that to USDA this past year. It's what you have are individuals who own undivided interests on multiple reservations and really can't transact between those reservations very well. And I think the tribes could get together and do an intertribal trading platform that would allow folks to do that. Um, one of the things we had was a database from the BIA and the largest. Um, number of interests were one woman who's 45 years old and she had 345 different interests on six different reservations and it totaled less than 100 acres if you took the equivalency that's that's the stuff that keeps us from using our land effectively and if we could get to a trading platform of between tribes i think we could resolve some of that I think you're chomping at the bit, bro. Go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just had a real quick thing that I just remembered. So if in the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs or in this in the federal, federal leads where like if land gets put into trust is where that's decided. And something that can happen is tribes can give letters of support and write letters to their congressperson or their house or senate rep, especially if they're in the committees that say that they support another tribe getting land put into trust and also individual citizens can do this too like if you see a bill about land being put into trust in your state or in your region you can call or send a comment to your congressperson saying that i support this bill and this is something that's important to me and that gets passed to the senators and the congress makers and congress makers policy makers <laughs> And they are able to be like, oh, okay, this has a lot of support and that push pressure on them to help push that bill to actually be in a trust quicker. And so that's another way that tribes can work together. And also in my region, like the Yurok, Kuru, Kupa, Talawa, Iyot, like a lot of us are like intermixed. Like if you're you're helping a Yurok system, like myself, you're often like, or you're helping Fruxes and you're helping each other because a lot of us are married into the same families in the region and our kids just have to, you know, like me, I participate in both cultures, but I have to be enrolled in one officially. And yet I still live around those other land bases and benefit from them because my family is in them. And so there's a lot of good that can be done because, right, we're not all completely separate. A lot of us are mixed into multiple tribes in the region. Thank you so much. Uh, right over to you, Adam. I think one of the largest principles that at least Opusu tries to operate on is when we speak on behalf of our sovereignty or our expansion of lands um, with either the 
state or federal government that we, we really are just speaking for ourselves and not try to blanket whatever opinions or actions that our tribe is taking and to assume that this is affecting the other Dakota tribes in Minnesota or, or even the Anishinaabe Ojibwe tribes in northern Minnesota. Um, avoiding that premise that one tribe has the ability to speak for all tribes, I think is really important. Um, I think often the general public wants an easy answer of pooling the tribes together as one. Here's what the Indians think, so on and so forth. We've seen a lot of that this past year with just the different types of legislation affecting tribal nations in the state of Minnesota. Um, and so, at least from an upper suit community point of view of maintaining that individual sovereign status that we speak for ourselves and we would always support any other tribal nation speaking for themselves and pursuing legislation that um, that they want to pursue on their own behalf. But just trying to reaffirm to one another what sovereignty is and continually reminding us of what that means and looks like and that perception matters ultimately to the general public. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're getting uh, fairly close to time, but there's, I think there's enough time for one more question. I've got one in my um, um, inbox here. What would you recommend for someone who may have an inheritance of land, farmers from South Dakota? What, it, that's in parentheses, what is the most equi equitable way to redistribute? And I'm going to just open it up, whomever wants to answer that one first. Well, I can tell you we've had, uh, as Adam was describing what goes on in Southwest Minnesota, I mean, we're, we get uh, offers from throughout the country on folks wanting to give back their land. Um, and I should say give back their land because oftentimes you get to the point where you say, well, is there... Um, any impediment on this land, like a loan, <laughs> and you tend to find out that in fact it comes with a loan. Um, but but a lot of it is, um, you know, for one, you want to know whether a tribe that uh, is nearby is going to want to have that land and manage that land. So when we get a suggestion, someone wants to um, give a piece of property. We'll work with the, the local tribes around, do you want this land? Can you manage this land? Otherwise, we're right up front with the landowners and say, look, the tribes can't, can't manage it. They don't want to have to get burdened with it. Your best bet is to sell it and make a donation to the tribe. And, um, and if you don't want to do a donation to the tribe, you can do one to the foundation and we'll turn around and do one to the tribe. Um, it's just, you know, there's this expectation that the tribes can deal with all this land, but until we get to a point where uh, tribal land is recognized as native nation land, uh, that land will end up under county jurisdiction and, and fee, st fee status, and the tribe will have to pay taxes, they'll have to be paying liability insurance on it, all these other pieces, and so not all land will come back to the tribes. Yeah, I think okay. I kind of spoke to that point earlier. We've had people wanting to donate their land it's 15, 20 miles away from the Upper Sioux community. It's hard to get land into trust in the first place if it's not contingent of your current land base. And then you end up with this piece of land that you have to manage and resource that's outside of your community area in the first place. And now it's subject to um, those county and local taxes. Um, but to try to keep those practicalities in mind, but as Chris said, you know, if you do have land you want to give back and you are in close proximity to a tribe, just reach out to them and have a conversation with their tribal government and see what that could look like. Go ahead, Burke, if you have um, thoughts to weigh in. <laughs> I mean, I, I think they have much better advice. I mean, one of the things I know you can do is just like, right, contact the nearest tribe and see what they think for themselves personally. And if that's something 
that they can make a decision on. I think the idea of making a donation is amazing and really beneficial um, because then money can get distributed where they need it the most in the tribe for things that are harder to get grants on, such as like, I know my tribe, we could always do this more money for our language program, which also helps with restoration work since so much of our knowledge on plants and animals is and land is in the language itself. And yet that's undervalued, I feel a lot of times in, to the wider public. But yeah, I also know if you're thinking long-term too, there's ability to put, um, create a living trust and putting people in, people or nonprofit or organizations in that living trust. And so you could even find like a native nonprofit organization that can then benefit after you pass away if you want to put your land into a living trust where then they don't have to pay those capital gains taxes and can decide what to do with it from there if it would be beneficial for them to restore the land or do the same thing where they sell it and then also use that donation to help tribal entities. But yeah, I, I think thinking about that is a great start and considering what happens to the future of land that you know we want to eventually benefit tribes or they could give it to a tribal college right <laughs> you, you can also give it to me no. <laughs> <laughs> i love that idea though i love that that, that um that thought uh, in terms of like there are plenty of entities there's lots of um nonprofits. there's lots of um, organizations that are doing sovereignty work, not just necessarily within the land realm, but while also within culture, language, education. There's lots and lots of places where things like this could be of benefit. And this kind of calls out the tribal nations as well, in that we need to work on avenues within our tribal governments to kind of streamline this process so that we have, um, you know, what's in place in order to be able to receive such things. Uh, and really push forward the whole idea of land back you know so so yeah that's that's a call for for ourselves to call call to action for us as well don't forget your tcus either though so <laughs> okay um i think we have time for just one final question and it's gonna be super quick um what are thoughts of the panel on having an honor tax with money going to local tribes I'm sorry, having a what? An honor tax with money going to local tribes. This was an audience question. Well, I'm not sure how the, at what an honor tax necessarily is. The, there's a bill currently um, to be introduced in the Minnesota legislature that in their next session that would be a deed tax essentially um, going to Indian programs. And it's a very small, I mean, it's like 0. 0.0005 would be on a deed tax. So it's about $100 on a $300,000 deed. Um, but that's about to be introduced. And, and it's, um, you know, it, it really deals with what, what should Minnesota be doing um, since they took so much Indian land and and have not um, done the work to even consider what that means in terms of underlying, if you want to call it rent, um, rent. <laughs> the thing I would mention too, we don't use reparations at the foundation. We don't know how you would ever do reparations for taking everyone's land and killing their ancestors just doesn't seem like reparations are gonna get you there. We'd be happy if they just live up to their treaties. Yep, definitely. Go ahead, Brooke. Yeah, um, just to clarify, uh, my understanding of an honor tax is a way to honor native nations in the US through, it's a voluntary tax, but because it's not technically a gift or donation, it's called like a tax. And it's just a way to, you know, decide your own amount you want to pay if you're living on, well, everyone's living on native land. When you're living on someone else's native land to that either organization or the tribe. So for example, that's kind of what it's like for the Amamutsin Land Trust is that 
people who live here who like say you hear a land acknowledgement at the beginning of a presentation going one step beyond that would be donating to the land trust and then giving the Amamutsin the resources to be able to relearn and restore the land in the ways that they see applicable. And so I'm in support of honor taxes and I think it's a great way to help support local tribes in a way that's like not forced. And, you know, there needs to be a lot more that's done. And like you said, there's no way to like, you can't ever like pay to absolve guilt of the harm that's been done or all the profit that's been taken by taking this land from us. But it's a start and it's a way that you can go one step beyond a land acknowledgement, especially like if you don't have the time or ability to go and personally support the tribes in the way you want. So I, I think it's a great idea. Go ahead, Adam. Yeah, I'll be brief. I want to echo a lot of what Chris had said there. Uh, Minnesota particularly still has a lot of reckoning in how much uh, specifically, specifically Dakota land that was taken, stolen in terms of that reclamation process for all the Dakota tribes. And that honor tax or reparation will always fall short of those 1851 treaties that were abrogated in 1862. And then to echo what Brooks said, no amount can ever absolve that guilt and that in terms of monetary gain or financial um, absolution that, you know, we have a long way to go yet, long story short. Definitely. I mean, especially when the um, generations following it might not have been the people here who, who are here now, but the generations following still continue to benefit from the resource that was taken. That, yeah. That's the point to be made. So. I have one and quick I think that's comment. That's something that people forget too. Go ahead, Adam. Sorry, no. It's um, when when people say people or native nations get things for free, it's uh, nothing is ever free. Our ancestors already paid that debt, and that debt, whatever that looks like financially, culturally, spiritually speaking, will always be there. And we're still paying the debt as Indigenous people too, and the repercussions of that. Like again, even just there's a lot larger traumas here too, but even me just like trying to move back to my homeland so I can participate in ceremony so I can be close to my family and try to be that good role model. And I can't afford land in my own area. And that feels ridiculous to me that I can't afford to move back home. And, you know, all the trauma that comes with having the environmental repercussions that was happened from degradation of the land that was forcefully taken from us. Absolutely. Okay, folks, um, I'm going to offer my thanks, my deep gratitude to our panelists. This was a great, great session. There was so much shared today, and I know we could go on for days and days. I literally teach this stuff for full semesters on my campus. So um, thank you so much for those who were here to listen with us. I'm so grateful to each one of our panelists. Matsu um, uh, to each one of you, and uh, I'm going to hand it back to Wayne. Wow. So I'm a little bit flabbergasted and a loss for words. I want to just say I, I, how much I appreciate the panelists, your stories, the wisdom you shared with us today, uh, questions from the chat. I mean, there was a lot of energy around this today's event, which I think shows how important the topic is. So I want to say Wopi Latanka or great thanks to our panelists, Adam, Brooke, and Chris, and to Dr. Baker for moderating. We want to thank all of you who attended today's virtual event. We hope you feel inspired to continue learning about these issues and share that information with members of your community. If you learned something today and enjoyed the event, consider making a contribution to Native Governance Center. Visit our website, nativegov.org, to donate today. Uh, additionally, we'd like to hear from you. So we're going to email a survey out uh, to folks. Sorry, my screen just blipped. Uh, we're going to email a survey out to our Zoom attendees and post a link in our Facebook comments section as well. Stay tuned to our virtual events. Our next event is slated for September, and we plan to announce our topic and speakers very soon. Many blessings to you all. Thank you for attending our virtual event today.